Psalm chapter number 85. Again, reading in verse number 5, the psalmist writes, Wilt thou be angry with us forever, wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Now, the psalmist in this verse, or in these verses, is talking about how God has allowed judgment and punishment to come to his people for their wicked ways. In fact, in verse number 8, I believe it was, he says, yes, let, but let them not turn again to folly. There's a history throughout the people of Israel that for one generation they would follow after God and then afterwards a few generations may follow them, but then it would turn. And it would turn to wickedness or unrighteousness. In fact, when the kingdom was divided into Israel and Judah, you could never find a time where both of them was on the same page. One would seem to be living for the Lord and the other one would be against the Lord. And then once things would get situated in where they used to be against what the Lord was wanting to do, then the other one would turn to folly. Don't look down your nose at the people of Israel. We're no different. Right? We're still the same today. You hear about one church doing well, next thing you know, well, what happened to them? I don't know. They're off the map. Right? They went and they started doing something crazy. Well, verse number 5, the psalmist says, Lord, I know that we've been fools, that we've acted foolishly, we've turned to folly. But he also knows that God is merciful, that God is gracious, that God is long-suffering, that God loves his people. So he asks in verse number 5, Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? He says, Lord, I know that we deserve what we're going through right now. Notice, does he never pray to take away judgment? He knows that they deserve to be judged for the way that they had previously lived. Nowhere in here does he say, Lord, will you not reward evil with punishment? What he's asking is, Lord, I know we deserve it, but the next generation, we do read that the Bible says that sin followed to the third and fourth generation. He says, I know that the next generation's coming. He says, will they not deserve to hear the mercy and the truth of the Lord? He says, my generation, we messed up. We're paying for us. He says, what about the next generation and the generation after that? He says, don't they deserve to know that God is merciful and gracious and that he loves them and that he's long-suffering towards them? And he goes into verse number 6, Wilt thou not revive us again? Lord, do you really want your people to be in a constant state of judgment for the rest of time? Of course God doesn't. God wants his people to live victoriously. He wants to live them in fellowship with them. He wants to see his people live in the spitting image of his son. That's what God desires. So when the psalmist says, Wilt thou not revive us again? He's not tempting God and saying, Lord, I know we failed you again, but you're going to revive us again. That's not what he's saying. He says it with a broken heart. He says, Lord, I know why we're in the shape we're in, and we deserve it. But there are some people that still desire to be close to you. Would you revive us again? Didn't you promise that if your people would turn from their wicked ways and repent, that they would seek after you, that you would heal our land, that you would revive them? He says, Lord, I know that you will. It's a rhetorical question. Then in verse number 7, you see his real prayer. He says, show us mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Granted, this is Old Testament. 
when he says salvation, Old Testament, you don't find a lot of mercy. You don't find a lot of grace. It's there, but you find a whole lot of law. But yet the psalmist knew enough about God to know that God was merciful. He knew enough about the Lord to know that only His way would lead to salvation. Well, verse number 8, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. That's half the problem. Well, I'd say maybe more than half the problem. In the last days there will be a famine for the hearing of the word. The psalmist says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. He says, I can't speak for everybody else. He says, Lord, I want to be revived. Lord, I want to receive your mercy so that I might find your salvation. He says, God, I will hear. If nobody else does, I want to hear what you have to say. He doesn't say, I'll listen. He says, I will hear. He says, I'm going to think on it. I'm going to chew on it. I'm going to meditate on it. It's going to be more than just going into one ear and out the other ear. I'm going to comprehend what it is that God says. I'm going to incorporate it into my life. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. You know why he's so confident that he's going to hear it? Because he says, For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. The only way that one can receive salvation, the only way that one can, in truth, receive mercy, when God spoke to you and told you that you was a sinner, it wasn't because he wanted to make you feel awful. It's not that he wanted to rob you of sleep. It's not that he wanted to convince you that you was dying and going to hell. No, it was so that he could speak the peace of Christ to you. You first had to understand where you were before he could speak peace unto you. Jesus didn't get up and rebuke the seas and say, peace be still, when they were calm. You can only speak peace when somebody's already in a lot of turmoil and a lot of trouble. He says, I will hear because we're in such a mess that God's words are going to be peace. To truly comprehend what God says to you, God wants you to have a peaceful life. I didn't say that God didn't want you to have a life without storms and trials and turmoil. But in the midst of that storm, guess where Jesus was? Sleep. In the middle of the ship. While it says, the Bible says that the boat was filled with water, but yet Jesus is still sleeping. Why? He had peace from the Father. When he's walking across the water in the middle of that storm, he told them, I'll see you on the other side. They were going to make it. They just didn't think that they were going to. If they had heard what the Son had said unto them, then they would have had peace. Doesn't matter how bad the storm's going to get, boys. Jesus said, well, he's making it to the other side. They still had to go through the storm, but in the midst of the storm, they could have had peace. The psalmist isn't saying that God's going to speak peace to everything around me. He's going to speak peace to me and to his people. He says, but let them not turn again to Father. He says, God will revive us. He says, I have no doubt. But Lord, don't let them turn again to folly. He says, I know it's not going to be any good to be revived if God's people just go back to what they were before they was revived. To surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Those that reverence the Lord, it's real easy for the Lord to reach down and to pluck them out of whatever situation they're in. Why? Because they're already close to God. Notice what he says in the beginning of the verse. Surely, meaning without a doubt, his salvation is nigh them that fear him. Again, we're not talking about saved on your way to heaven. We're talking about deliverance in this verse. So surely God's deliverance is nigh them or near them, close to them, within reach for those that fear him. If you fear God, you're walking right, you're living right, guess where that puts you? Right near God. 
In another place, the psalmist writes that he was safe where? Under his Lord's wings. You got to be close to God to get up underneath of his wing. Those sheep that are closest to the shepherd are the ones that don't have to worry about losing them. Where are they going? They're going where the shepherd goes. Where's the shepherd going to take them? A place where there's not danger. And if there is danger, guess what happens? The shepherd can take a step and get right to where they're at. It's the ones on the fringes. They're the ones that are in danger. Why? Because they're not near the shepherd's salvation. Where are they? They're far off. Surely the Lord's deliverance is nigh them that fear Him. Why? Because if you're close to God, God's real close to doing what? Intervening in your situation. It says, Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Well, what's this? This is what happens after revival in these two verses first we start off in the verses that we read right Lord I know that you'll revive us again if we position ourselves correctly then he goes on to speak about how close God's deliverance really is he says we don't need to move heaven and earth in order for God to revive us God's salvation his deliverance his mercy his truth it's just as close to us as we are to Him. He says, if we get back to where we're supposed to be, surely God will do something. But then, these verses, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Then it says, truth shall spring out of the earth. Right? He goes on to, God's already done some preparing. In verse number 10. He says, and in verse number 11... It'll come to fruition if we allow it to. He says, there's just some things that are true. That's verse number 10. And then verse number 11, if we allow them things to impact us, then it'll change our world. Well, you say, Brother Jordan, verse number 10 and verse number 11, those are the after effects of what happens after people get revived. This is what true revival looks like after revival has happened. In verses 10 and 11. But what's true revival? You got to go all the way back to verse number 5. You got to get right with God. You've got to position yourself to where you, where you used to be or even closer than where you used to be so that you can get back to doing what? Walking hand in hand with God every day. Right? That's revival. But then the psalmist didn't stop the chapter after his people have revived. He says, no, let them turn not back to folly. Don't let them go back to what they used to be. Let them continue in these things instead. Verse 10 and 11. It says, verse number 10, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So here we've got two, metaphorically, relationships. You've got truth and mercy. But then you've got peace and righteousness. Anybody remember that? Show married with children. Love and marriage. Love and marriage. Can't have one without the other. Well, that's what these verses are talking about. You can't have mercy. I mean, you can't have truth without mercy. You can't have peace without righteousness. He says they go hand in hand. You want to know why the world's in the way that it is today? Because there's no peace in it. Amen. Why is there no peace? Because there is no right righteousness any longer. Amen. You want to know why there's no truth abundant to where people readily know what it is? There was a time that if you asked somebody what was going on, like, hey, what do you think about this? They'd give you a true answer. They may not know all the politics of the day. They may not know... Right, who said this and when they said that. But they had enough God in their life that if you'd ask them a question, they'd tell you what the Bible said. They'd give you truth. May not give you the answer that you thought you was going to get, but they had truth. You don't know why there's no more truth anymore? Because there's no more mercy. 
says mercy and truth are met together. You know what that means? They've met. They're separated. They are joined in a place. They had a meeting. So if somebody says, oh, hey, I'm looking for truth, where do I find them? Oh, they're with mercy. Hey, anybody seen mercy? Yeah, they're with truth. In order to get to one, you've got to go see the other. They're in the same spot. They've met together. Well, let's break that down. What does mercy have to do with truth? I thought, Brother Jordan, I thought mercy was giving people what they don't deserve. True. That is a correct definition. Mercy is avoiding what somebody deserves and giving them what they need instead. Mercy is compassion. An attribute of mercy is long-suffering. If you want to be merciful to people, you've got to be willing to swallow maybe righteous indignation, maybe anger. You may have to swallow pain. You may have to deal with being afflicted so that somebody else can instead not get what they deserve. You must be merciful. But why mercy and truth in the same conference room, so to speak? Why do you have to go to mercy in order to see truth? And why in order to get to truth do you have to go through mercy? In all honesty, truth, when it comes to biblically speaking, truth are things that are infallible. They do not change. They are settled. They're undisputed. Truth is true and everything else is not true. Well, what's the only thing that I find that outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven and earth shall pass away, but what? His word shall not pass away. Amen. Truth is functionally, the definition of truth is what God has preserved in His message to mankind. Everything true that the world knows is because of what God has preserved. Notice how one day somebody's the best politician in the world, next day because they didn't pet somebody's cat or kiss somebody's baby, now all of a sudden they're the worst in the world. Or they dug something up from 20 years ago that used to be perfectly fine, but now because everybody's a bunch of sissies, you know, that's the worst thing in the world and that person doesn't have a job anymore. But there's no truth in the world. You know what there is? There's news. News and truth are two different things. Amen. And I'm not interested in your truth. I'm interested in the truth. Yeah. What is true? True is telling what is and what is not. True divides the line between right and wrong. Truth is the dictionary that lets you walk through life and know what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. Why do we have truth? Why do we have the Word of God? Why do we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us to lead and guide us into all truth? Why is that? Because God was merciful to man. Man was wicked. Man was sin-cursed by man's own decision. Man's offspring were sin-cursed because man chose to disobey God. Man was sinful, but yet God spoke to man truth. You know how he did that? He used a whole lot of mercy. Mercy means that you care enough about the outcome that you're willing to put aside what somebody deserves so that they can have something better in return. You're never going to share the truth with the world until you get real merciful with them. So many people that could care less about the world. If you asked them, well, I just want to go to church. I want to be able to live my life. I don't find that Christians can keep to themselves. I find that everybody that got in wanted to go tell somebody else. Why? Because the fruit of the Spirit started budding in their life. And the love of God will cause you to care about other people. You know when you'll start sharing the truth with them? When you care enough about them to become merciful. 
You don't get truth without mercy. Somebody doesn't come to where you're at in a place that they may have used to have been in. I don't know about you, but if you get out of a burning house, it's real hard to turn back around and run back into that burning house. You don't just do that for no reason. Why would you do that to help somebody else get out of the burning house? You have to be merciful in order to go back to, what you, to where you used to be in order to try and help somebody else get out of it. The carnal man would not want to return to a place that he used to be. What are you saying? You may roll and rain over your body today. It may be under subjection to you. You came to church. You may be ready to receive. You give it a week or two without reading your Bible, praying, hitting, missing whenever you want to. Your flesh isn't going to come back to where it just used to go, which is church. Where's it going? It's going to where it wants to go to. Well, spiritually, it don't make much sense. Well, Brother Jordan, why would I spend time around lost people? I didn't say go live like them. But if you're merciful, you can go to where they're at without becoming like them. Why are you going? To show them truth. You know what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious people of Jesus' day said? He was a friend of publicans and sinners. Yeah. Because he showed mercy to them. They thought it was friendship. What he was concerned with was giving them truth. It was merciful unto them. He knew what they were. He knew where they were at. He knew where their lifestyle would take them if they continued to do it. But yet he set all that judgment aside. Why? To show them mercy. And tell them what they really needed. Can't have truth without mercy. Unless you're merciful, you'll think that somebody's going to deserve what they got. And then the truth that you want to share with them is that they're damned and they're on their way to hell and that you know, they're going to burn and pay for their sins for all of eternity, not just in hell, but in the lake of fire. I don't find too much mercy in that. Sounds like damnation to me. I thought we were supposed to preach life. You know where life comes from? Truth. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Can't have truth without also having life. Why? Because both are in Christ. So how do we get life to a lost and dying world? You must be merciful and show them the truth. How do we help backslidden people? What do you do when you get back and get back to truth? Because wherever you can get to truth, mercy's not far behind. And truth will show you where you're at, but it'll also tell you how to get back to where you need to be. Truth is, in all honesty, deliverance. Now granted, you've got to make the decision. You've got to choose whether to do what it is the truth says or to continue the way that you're going. But mercy brings about truth. Why? So that you can get to where God desires you to be. Because they're met together. You know what together means? They're not apart. They're attached. If you put something together, it means that what used to be many things are now one thing. You done put it together. But mercy and truth are together. You know what that means? You can't separate them. When Christ came and he lived as the Word, which we know is forever settled in heaven. Why? Because it's true. True don't change. But when he came as the Word made flesh, everybody's expecting, right, Christ, the deliverer, to come and to set up his kingdom. He says, now this time we're just going to be merciful. He says, if I set up my kingdom right now, there's a whole lot of people that I love, that I don't want to see die and go to hell, that would be condemned and damned. He hadn't grafted in the vine yet to where Gentiles could get into the family. He says, right now I'm coming right, to speak truth, to show mercy, so that when he does set up his kingdom, there are many more sons at the Father's house. Well, they're together. He says, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Now that don't mean 
right? Like some of us driving. It's like, hey, you just hit that pole back there. Nah, I just kissed it, right? That is not what the context is here. Okay, it doesn't mean that you just glanced it. That you just winged it. So it says, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Now, under Bible days, you didn't do that unless you was married. Again, what's that mean? It shows a union, a joining. Does not the Bible say that two shall be made one flesh? What's that mean? Used to, you had two things. Now, they're inseparable from each other. Can't have one without the other, like we said. But now, they are intertwined. If you take two strings and you strip them apart and then you weave them back together, you've still only got one string. Used to, you had two, but now you got one. Well, where's the old one go? It's just a part of that new one. It says righteousness and peace. If they have joined, why is it that peace and righteousness go hand in hand? Because in order to have true peace, it is not having peace with man that you desire. If you seek after peace, you seek peace between you and God. You know why there's no peace in the world today? Because people don't want to have peace personally with God. You want to know why the world is in such a mess today? Because people are more concerned about their relationship with man and what other people think about them and what they want to do to those other people rather than considering what it is that God would have them to do in their life. In all honesty, you could come up to me and say, Brother Jordan, today's Sunday school message has offended me very much. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry for what I said because what I said was true. But I'm sorry that you were offended. If I was being real honest, I'd say, well, that's between you and God, and I'm sorry you were offended, but if you were offended, it's because you've got a problem with Jesus. Because all I did was give the Bible. Yeah. I will not apologize for truth. Sometimes I'll apologize for the delivery method of that truth. Don't find out we're supposed to beat people over the head with it. Why? Because the truth comes with what? Mercy. But here it says righteousness and peace. In order to have peace, peace, there must be righteousness, and without righteousness there is not peace. You cannot continue to have peace unless you maintain righteousness. It says they have kissed each other. Well, righteousness by definition, is living as God says that we ought to live. Don't matter where you go, Old Testament or New Testament, guess what you're going to find God's expectation is? Be ye holy, for I am holy. You know what righteousness is? Denying yourself and embracing what God says ought to be in your life. Don't care where you go, in order to be righteous, you must do what thus saith the Lord. Well, because he was merciful unto you, he gave you the truth. Now, what do you do with that truth? You either embrace it and you become righteous, or you reject it and become rebellious. You know what rebellion leads to? War, discord. Right? Everything that we see in the world today. Rebellion, the Bible says, is as the sin of witchcraft. You've rejected what God has said, and what are you going to believe? Whatever it is that you want to believe instead. That's just as foul and demonic and as wicked as believing a false religion. God was merciful and He showed you the truth, but if you choose to believe something else, that's rebellious. That's wicked. That's the spirit of Antichrist, as the Bible would call it. You know why the world is in the shape that they thought that they is in the end, end times. Why? Because they said that the spirit of Antichrist in their day was strong. I wonder what they would see if they could see today's day and age. They thought that it was as wicked as it could get. They said, we know in the last days it's going to be as the days of Noah, where man's thoughts were evil continually. 
be saying, is that where we're at, Brother Jordan? I don't know, but we've got to be close. Well, in order to have peace, what do you got to have? Righteousness. The world does not know the peace of God because God's people stopped showing it to the world a long time ago. Churches don't know the peace of God because people aren't worried about being righteous before God. Homes are in turmoil and they have no peace. Why? Because a long time ago the heads of households stopped caring about what it is their family was doing in the eyes of God. All they cared about was themselves. They had no mercy for other people, so what? They didn't show the truth. See how it all becomes cyclical in the end? In order to be righteous, you must first receive the truth, which means what? Somebody had to be merciful unto you. First, God had to be merciful unto you. But God chooses to use people. And God moved the heart of somebody in your life so that they shared the truth with you. Well, then you are delivered with the truth. What do you get? You get the decision to either become righteous or to stay rebellious. Truth always brings a decision. That's why the Bible says that God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. Teaching imparts knowledge. Preaching requires a decision to be made. It confronts you. True preaching isn't getting up and getting loud and spitting and slobbering and talking about how great God is. That's just called worship. That's called praise. True preaching is when a preacher with a backbone like a saw log will open his book and rear back and tell you what the truth is and God will convict you to make a decision about it. That's preaching. Don't worry, the Bible's profitable for preaching and teaching exhortation there's a whole lot of good you can do with the word of God from behind the pulpit but it ain't preaching if you ain't got to make a choice with what was presented it requires you to get real transparent before God truth requires you to either accept or reject it there's a whole bunch of nonsense that I don't even pay attention to why because I don't need to decide what to do with it it's sounding brass and tinkling. Simple. It's just a bunch of background noise. Truth will illuminate, but then it'll also cause you to make that decision. Here's where you're at. Now choose whether you want to get closer or further away. But why did you become righteous? Because he robed you in his righteousness because you were obedient to the truth. You did not make yourself righteous. He gave righteousness to you because you could not attain it on your own. Your righteousness is his filthy rags. God's not impressed with what you can do. So where does that righteousness come from? Christ robed you in himself. You're engraved in the palms of his hands. He bore your sins so that you could be in him and he could be in you. That's what the Bible says. He became your sin so that he could become your righteousness. Why is that so important, Brother Joe? Because without justification, without him taking away that sin, you could not be robed in his righteousness. And without that righteousness, you could not have peace in your life. Because righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Is he not the Prince of Peace? Did he not promise that his yoke was easy and his burden was light? What's that called? That's called peace. Peace. You know, it's hard knowing that there's something between you and God that God wants to take care of, but you keep holding on to it. That's the ways of a transgressor are hard. That's what that means. God tells you it's wrong, but you keep holding on to it. You're not going to have peace in your life. You know what peace is? When God says, everything's okay between you and me. We have fellowship. Our company is dear one to another. In fact, God thinks that your company is so dear that as you get close to Him, guess what you find? He'll shield you for some things like we talked about in the verses before this. Surely God will deliver His people. Why? Because He delights in His people. If He does not delight in what they're doing, He'll allow those things to come. Why? To correct them. 
to show them the truth of the fact that they're not where they need to be. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying everybody likes peace. These are the after effects of revival. That's why you start off with, Lord, wilt thou not revive us again? He says, Lord, I know we deserve to be where we're at. But Lord, it'd sure be good if you just showed up and did something merciful to us. He says, Lord, if nobody else listens, I'm going to hear what it is that you have to say. If nobody else, well, God, I want to be revived. And then he goes on to say why he wants to be revived. He says, mercy and truth are met together. Lord, if you show us mercy by giving us the truth, then we'll be able to walk in your paths once again. He says, God, it's been wicked so long, I don't know how to get back to where it is that you want us to be. I need you to tell me. But then he says, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Lord, we can't have your peace without first submitting ourselves to your righteousness. Well, Lord, I don't know what your righteousness is. It's too high for me. It's too holy for me to comprehend in this same cursed mind. He says, but I do know that if truth shows up, and we walk in your truth that we're going to find your righteousness right there along with it. He says, and once we find that righteousness, if you'll robe us in it, if you'll take it and put it on us, because we can't take the righteousness of God and apply it to ourselves. He says, if you do that, then I know that we'll have peace. He said, he's not talking about peace in the world. I know what's going to happen to the world. I've read the back of the book. It's going to get less and less peaceful. But this is a personal peace. And there's a space of grace where we can take that peace between us and God and we can go out and we can give it to others through what? Mercy. By giving them the truth. And with that truth, they can make the decision on whether or not they want to become righteous in the eyes of God. And then once they're robed in that righteousness, guess what they'll have? Peace. It's a real simple math problem. If you add God into somebody's life, you shower them with the things of God and with the words of God, guess what it is? That's called mercy. Because they don't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. Adam and Eve didn't deserve it when God slew those animals to make clothes for them. God covered their sin up. Why? As an act of mercy. He said, I could choose to see it, but right now I'm going to choose not to see it. Not because it's better for me, but because it'd be better for you. And in that mercy, guess what they heard? Truth. You know what that truth led to? To a choice. Cain and Abel. Cain, he chose to reject the truth of God. He didn't get any righteousness. In fact, that's why he was jealous of his brother Abel because Abel just said, this is what God expects and this is what I'm going to do. God delighted in it. God praised him for it. Glorified him for it. Magnified him for it. And Cain got jealous. You know why that happened? Because he rejected truth. Abel had righteousness. Guess what? As far as we know, Abel was the first one to ever enter into that place called paradise. Abraham's bosom, as it would eventually be called, even though, why wasn't it called Abel's bosom? He was there first. Abraham hadn't even been born yet. Wouldn't be for a couple thousand years. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? He had peace, not just in this life, the next life. Then one day, he was part of that group where Jesus led captivity captive. Guess what? He got to hear Jesus preach about what Jesus had just done for him so that they could be saved the same way we did, through the blood. You know what they received as an act of Jesus applying blood to their life? Peace between them and God. But look, verse number 11, Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. It doesn't say mercy comes from earth. It says truth shall spring up from the earth. God poured His mercy out on man. How? Through His Son, Christ. Why? Because for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God has been more than merciful. It's just that the world doesn't know it. But if you go and start talking about all that 
mercy that God has shown to people, guess what's going to start springing up? The truth that the world needs Christ. People hear that truth, they're going to have to make the decision. But then it says, righteousness shall look down from heaven. Righteousness don't come from earth. We've already talked about that. The world is cursed by sin. But God in His righteousness looks down at the earth and when He sees truth spring up and He sees people embrace it and He sees people allow the Lord to start changing their life, guess what He imparts unto them? Righteousness. And as a result of it, guess what there is between heaven and earth? Peace. You know what the after effects of revival truly are? It's that God's mercy, God's truth, God's righteousness and God's peace start transforming the world. Not just you, because the psalmist said, Lord, I'm going to hear. But then in verse number 11, truth shall spring up. He says, Lord, if you revive me, if you revive your people, truth's going to spring up. It shall. It's not, well, Lord, if it happens, then we might see truth jumping around, welling up. He says, no, it shall happen. Because if you get revived, you're going to start spreading the truth. Why? Because you are appreciative for the mercy God showed to you and you want to be the instrument to deliver God's mercy to somebody else. Truth shall spring up. A great outpouring. Because you know what revival truly is? It's just getting back to where you actually love the fact that God saved you. Instead of waking up every day and feeling like you've been run over. Instead of waking up every day and feeling like God's forgotten you, it's impossible for God to forget you. He knew you before He formed the world. He knew your need, which is why before the foundation of the world, Jesus had already committed to the plan to become the lamb that would be slain for your salvation. God's never forgot about you. God's never not loved you. Well, then how come I don't feel the way I used to? Maybe it's because you were presented with truth and you rejected it. But God is merciful. He's long-suffering. That truth is still true. You know what you got to do? you just got to decide to accept it. Admit it. Repent of what it was that you'd done. Guess what? If He forgives it, for faithful to confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness you know what that means that means it's like just like when the blood was applied to your life when you were saved it's gone doesn't exist anymore because you know what you do or what he does when you after you get saved you repent of something you confess it you ask him to forgive you for it he applies the same blood that you did or that he did when he got saved. Lester Roloff used to saying that that blood goes deeper than the stain. You know what that means? It's as if it had never happened, never existed. That's how you have to get back to having peace with God. It's got to be as if you never left the Father's house in the first place, that you never rejected truth in the first place. There's only one way that can happen. The blood's got to be applied again. How's that happen? Through repentance, turning from what it was, and then embracing God's truth again. Because that's the only way you can have peace. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.